So thank you very much for, for being you. here uh, with us. Uh, as you perhaps know, Professor Sanjay said is here in order to participate in an international conference workshop that will take place next uh, this Friday. Um, and we also uh, invited him to uh, have a, a conversation in a quite perhaps informal way uh, on his work, on um, other issues concerning um, historiography, the practice, the practice of history. Um, Professor Sanjaset is also a consultant of a, a, a funded project by FCT that we are now starting at the uh, Institute for Contemporary History, a project on uh, Emil Cabral that was also what allowed us to, 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 to have him here with us for, for, for more than one event. And I will now briefly present him after completing his education in Australia, in Sydney and Canberra. Uh, Sanjay Sat held positions at uh, Sydney University, La Trobe University, uh, as well as a fellowship uh, at Tokyo University. Then he moved to Goldsmiths in London in 2007 to take up the share in politics. He was also the director for the Center for Postcolonial Studies. He was one of the founders of the journal Postcolonial Studies, if I'm correct. And he has published in the fields of modern Indian history, political and social theory, post-colonial theory. Um, his books, but we will start this conversation by mentioning them in, uh, even if in a brief way, uh, describing uh, um, his uh, trajectory, academic and intellectual trajectory until now. He's mainly uh, he's author of two of two books. Uh, one of them. Uh, with his title, Marxist Theory and Nationalist Politics. It was due to this book that I come uh, to know his, his work. As some of you perhaps know, I, I did my PhD on communism and nationalism, and I was, as I was explaining to Professor Sanjay Seth yesterday, at the beginning of the PhD, by then we had these uh, funds for bibliography uh, that allowed us to buy whatever we wanted until 2,000 euros. This was in a period of uh, different uh, from <laughs> today's. And so I decided to, to buy um, almost every book that had uh, communism and nationalism in the title so that I would be inspired by the, the studies, uh, the, the, by those studies. And the, the work of, of Sanjay Seth was actually one of the most uh, inspiring uh, works. And from then on, I started following his work. He's also the author of um, another book, perhaps the book uh, that he was, he, that he's the author that was to be most well known within the, uh, the, the, the academic circles, Subject Lessons, The Western Education of Colonial India that was published by Duke University Press. He's also the author of several articles on historiography, theory of history, some of them translated into Portuguese, and I believe that at least some of the students that are here were invited uh, to read them in uh, the course of theory of history. Um, this conversation will have two parts. First part, I will conduce the conversation, I will make some uh, and some questions, um, and then on the second part, um, I will open the floor for discussion, for comments, questions, critics, and people can speak, of course, in Portuguese, and uh, uh, we can uh, translate the questions or uh, the comments you, you have to, to make. Um, so I will start with a um, somehow personal question. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to read the last sentence of the book subject, uh, subject lessons, where you, in the last paragraph, you wrote, um, Western knowledge arrived in India through the coercive agency of colonialism. We were told, most forthrightly by Macaulay, that this knowledge was true and that our knowledges, like or gods, were false. Then you had, Nonetheless, that knowledge has now become global. There is no easy point outside it, no escape from it, other than by engaging with and through it. And then you finish it by saying, but if those who were once subject to pedagogy can, long after they are gone, be studied in a fashion that subjects modern Western knowledge to critical scrutiny, 
There is a pleasing irony in the thought that Macaulay's bastard children will have contributed to the critical appropriation of a knowledge that was once imposed upon them. We will surely return to this book. Um, but as you mentioned, uh, your uh, childhood uh, <laughs> as a subject to Western knowledge uh, pedagogy, um, I would first question I would like to 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 post to you is concerns your personal trajectory, and then if you can also <coughs> address the beginning of the starting of your uh, academic trajectory, your first work, your PhD thesis, and give us just first for those that are not familiar with your work, uh, a brief account of it. Thank, thank you, Jose. And for, let me begin firstly by thanking you and thanking Paolo and my hosts for inviting me and giving me the chance to speak to you all um, and for their hospitality while I've been here. I'm really enjoying being in Lisbon. And I have to apologize to you for the fact that I do not speak in Portuguese and you are having to make all the effort to follow me um, in another language. Um, personal. Um, it, it, It has always struck me as odd that people in India... Th this is not a uniquely Indian story. It's a much wider story than that. But many of us grew up in two worlds. One was the world of formal knowledge, where we learnt science, rationality, etc., etc. And then there were other worlds, often but not necessarily represented by our mothers who might, you know, my mother was not particularly religious, but she would, you know, sometimes go to the temple and so on. So, and this is not a uniquely, many of you probably have this experience. So we inhabited two worlds which, however, never really came together. Now, if we followed the logic of what I learnt at school and so on, some of the people around me whom I cared deeply about belonged to a world of superstition or unreason or irrationality or... And yet, this world was all around me. This was not some minor remnant of a time past that had somehow survived into the 20th century. So at, at some point, much, much later, I mean, obviously as a child I didn't think of any of this, at some point I became interested in how it was that, speaking now at a purely personal level, we so often managed to inhabit these different worlds without ever us using one to reflect upon the other. It's as if we kept them separated. But that came much later. In fact, my earlier work, my, the book you refer to on Marxist theory and nationalist politics, was my PhD dissertation, um, which I undertook when I was a member of the Communist Party in Australia and active on the left. And it began as the book of a militant. I, in, I, in the way that you can only do when you are in your early 20s, I was going to come up with really big answers to big questions. Um, you know, the arrogance of youth, and I was going to find the solution to how one could be, how, what the Indian Communist Movement should have done and what it could now do. As it proceeded, it became a very different sort of enterprise. Um, by the end of that book, by the end of that project, which later became a book, um, some of the presumptions that I began with had now actually become problematic for me. And what I argue in that book... One argument is foregrounded, the other is only there in the background. The one that's foregrounded is that the way Marxism in the colonies operated was, the way in which it made itself relevant to countries where capitalist enterprise was not highly developed, where the proletariat was very small in numbers, where otherwise Marxism really should have been irrelevant. The ways in which it made itself relevant was through the development of an analysis of imperialism. Um, the world had become... Capitalist in one sense, you know, Marx's distinction between formal and real subsumption is then used by Lenin in order to argue that there is a global capitalist system, but that doesn't necessarily require that all the elements of that system themselves be highly developed or capitalist. It was a brilliant analysis, um, and I think in many important ways right. But one of its consequences politically was that what the communist movement in the colonies, or certainly in India, ended up doing was assuming that nationalism was progressive in a twofold sense. It was politically progressive because it would be a blow against imperialism and therefore would weaken capitalism globally. Alongside that was a historicist narrative which said that bourgeois democracy is historically more advanced than feudalism, 
and so on. You, you all recognize the historicist, and it culminates in the socialist modern. And the assumption here was that those two senses of progressive were isomorphic. They mapped onto each other. So the anti-colonial nationalist movement was progressive because it was anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, and it was progressive because it was bound to be carried by the historically progressive social forces. By the end of that book, I thought that those conclusions were in very important ways either wrong or needed to be fundamentally rethought. Um, and as I began, by the end of that book, I realised that, but I haven't actually done terribly much of the rethinking. That came to me later, and in a way my trajectory from Marxism to post-colonialism, which is not a term in which I have any great investment, I, it's, it just represents a space from which to think. But my trajectory from there was, was propelled by the fact that more and more I became interested in critiques of the nation-state. And critiques of nationalism in the colonies, not just for being insufficiently nationalist, which was the common leftist position, bourgeois nationalism is not radical enough in its nationalism, it compromises with the imperialists, etc. So not on those grounds, but on the grounds that the nation-state form itself might be an object of critique, not just the insufficient realisation of it. And then the historicist narrative, which thought the bourgeois modern was better than, than the so-called feudal, um, and therefore the bourgeoisie and the proletariat were historically progressive classes and the peasantry, even if they could be politically mobilised, were somehow the repository of something that was already part of the historical past and destined to be consigned to the dustbin of history. This now, all of these assumptions now seem to me extremely problematic. And, and in a way, that then carries my work. And much later, there's a long gap between those two books, much later in subject lessons, I, I, I address the question of um, our forms of knowledge and their universality. And by then, but, but sorry, I've gone on very long already, but uh, there's another way of telling this story, but maybe you should, should I just keep on talking? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm rambling a little, but this is how it actually happened. There's another way of retrospectively seeing what I did, which, which is retrospective. This is not what I was thinking at the time, necessarily. But a lot of our lives are retrospective, and a lot of history writing is retrospective. It's sort of from where you are now that you look backwards and construct a coherent narrative in which things link up in some sort of intelligible fashion. So the other way I could tell the story, and sometimes tell it to myself of my own work, is that what I was doing all along without knowing it was looking at how knowledge is born in Europe travel to the non-Western world. First at the level of formal systematic ideologies like Marxism, first book, and then in a more general and in a more ambitious sense to look at how the whole corpus of modern Western knowledge travels to the non-Western world, in this case India, and what happened to it as it travelled and what happened to the places that it travelled to, what the consequences of it were. Okay. Uh, so part of your uh, project, in a sense, um, participates in a general movement of critique of uh, Eurocentric perspectives, uh, namely uh, historiographical Eurocentric accounts of um, the non-Western world or of the history of Europe itself, of course. Um, and of course, post-colonial theory or post-colonial theories, mm. if we say it in the plural, they actually actively participate in this. Uh, but as you were mentioning, um, the problems that you were at a certain point at least facing was just not was not just the problem of what Eurocentrism makes to knowledge, but uh, advancing the question whether knowledge is and the knowledge with which we work. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and history as a discipline, social science is in itself. Uh, uh, condemned to be somehow ethnocentric or parochial or provincial, as mm. uh, uh, your Deepesh, colleague Deepesh, Deepesh Akarbarti, uh posed. And, and this makes a difference between several uh, contributions to the critique of Eurocentrism, because some of the critiques uh, of Eurocentrism, they are namely made in order to try to achieve a, a, a 
as you put in uh, in one article, a, a better a better science. Mm -hmm. That was not your purpose only, at least. That is, you had mm -hmm. a, a, a an epistemic problem that became actually the object of your research more than. Uh, uh, how how do you how do you look at these uh, different types of critique on, on of, of Eurocentrism? You have an article where you confront post-colonial theory to historical sociology. Here mm -hmm. in Portugal, we have a tradition of historical sociology that actually fits quite well in what you are saying. That mm -hmm. is a critique of uh, Eurocentrism in the name of uh, a more truthful, more objective uh, uh, science. Uh, in, in what sense would you uh, um, do you regard this uh, contribution of historical sociology and uh, and at, at uh, I mean uh, are they completely I mean un, uh, uncompa uh, not uh, uh, articulatable with your own post-colonial approach? Um, there is an affinity. The article you refer to is a very short one, and it was deliberately short Which was in translated order to be Portuguese, readable. Actually. Yes, recently in translated into Portuguese. Um, and bec partly because it's short, it's a very stylized and exaggerated, you know, in 2,000 words, you, you make stark distinctions. Nonetheless, I, I do, it is a distinction I want to make. I am sympathetic to both of those. It seems to me an important enterprise to show that the making of the modern world, the conventional narrative which you're all familiar with is that capitalism and modernity develop in Western Europe and then they, as it were, like you throwing a stone into a pond, the ripples go ever outwards. So it begins in Europe and then, then the rest of Europe and then Asia, Africa, etc. Um, and a lot of recent work, which, much of which I greatly admire, has sought to contest that by saying that right from the beginning, the global order was a global order, that you know the discovery of the Americas was absolutely essential to the emergence of capitalism and modernity, that Africa and Asia were not simply the recipients of a modernity that came with gunboats and goods and colonialism, but were actually involved in its production, albeit unwittingly and albeit under highly unequal, coercive um, and exploitative relations. It seems to me that work, which varies in quality, some of it is, as all work under any rubric does, is extremely important. It also seems to me, however, two things. One, perhaps the less important one, is to the degree that this is driven by the desire to undermine Eurocentrism, I think it's hostage to empirical fortune because it's essentially an empirical argument. And, you know, one day I asked myself, I was talking to a colleague and I asked myself, what if someone could definitively show that the Eurocentric account was true? Now, it's never going to happen because such complex stories, there will always be endless room for argument. But in principle, it could happen. There could be an overwhelming empirical case for showing that actually the conventional story is right. Would we then give up our anti-Eurocentrism? Is it wholly dependent upon empirical data? It seems to me not. It seems to me we recognise that what is, it is important that we recognise that political and ethical desire is invested in our contestations of Eurocentrism. So an empirical account might not be the best way of achieving the end that one is seeking to achieve. But the second and more important reason was the one you alluded to, that I became more and more interested in the limits of our knowledge systems, and it seemed to me that Historical sociology, I use the term very loosely, anti-Eurocentric historical sociology, was trying to correct what it saw as biased or, or problematic explanations by producing better explanations. But better explanations that still accepted the fundamental categorical grounds. You know, they're, they're part of the social sciences. A lot of my work, especially the more recent work of at least the last decade, if not more, has been interested in what the limits of our categories are, rather than in, as it were, refining those categories and making them better so that we can do better social science. So, in summary, I think that distinction is real. I think in that article, I deliberately, of course, in a stylized way, exaggerate it more, and I think it's perfectly possible, for instance, as a teacher to do both. 
I mean, when I teach my undergraduates, I do actually make available to them a literature which would contest the conventional account of the development of modernity. Um, at the same time, I try to push them in a, in a sort of theoretical post-colonial direction. Um, so I think the distinction is real, but I, you know, I don't think they're mortal enemies or anything. Um, mm -hmm. well, when, but when you mentioned, you, you were mentioning uh, uh, that f in your agenda, hmm. the questioning, the, the need to turn problematic the categories we use while analyzing uh, uh, past realities, um, that, that kind of work is a work without which you could not even imagine doing history nowadays. I mean, mm -hmm. as if there is no distinction between your theoretical reflection uh, on what is the practice of history and the practice of history itself. Mm -hmm. And you, you gave an example on your first uh, answer, mm -hmm. on your personal, mm -hmm. on the personal account of your, of your practice, the, the, or the case of religion. Mm -hmm. How do we secular uh, intellectuals, at least not if in our private life, on our public mm -hmm. uh, activity, uh, engage with religion as an object of study, mm -hmm. and the difficulties this is this this arises. Uh, the case of religion could also be made to, to other examples like magic, uh, mm -hmm. m myth, mm -hmm. uh, m memories, mm -hmm. in a broader sense, as a subjective practice of. Of, 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 of addressing of, of addressing the past at what what is the limit of the distinction therefore between for instance history as a discipline for you hmm. and a mythological account of the past ah um, okay the, your two questions in that can I start yes. with religion because the problem with religion is not, it's certainly what you say, it's how do we deal with the, you know, the academy, the social sciences are scientific, secular, etc. How do we, as historians, for instance, write about those whose world is not like that? A question that has been very well raised by my friend, Dipesh Chakrabarty. But in a sense, almost prior to that, and a, an illustration of what I mean about the problem of our categories, is the category of religion. We assume that there's something called religion, a genus of which Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, etc., are the different species. Now, I want to suggest to you, drawing upon the work of Talal Azad, Jonathan Zimmerman, and many others, um, Peter Harrison, that the very category of religion is in some important ways actually a Christian category. Because the, the construction of the idea of religion as something which, which is universal but then particularised, rested upon the idea that religion is essentially a matter of belief. Right? And then you could catalogue, Hindus believe this, Buddhists believe this, and that way you could divide religions. Now that itself is actually a product of the Protestant Reformation and what happens after it. There's a long and complicated history which people like Peter Harrison and others have written about. What I want to say is that there are parts of the world, even today, where religion is simply not a matter of belief and therefore the category religion is a deeply problematic one. Um, I'll give you an example and, and it, the example comes from the horse's mouth. Um, Max Muller, who is often called the founding father of comparative religion. Max Muller worked in Oxford. He was a brilliant Indologist, I mean a, a very, very fine scholar and he's called the father of comparative religion. Um, and Muller, by the way, never went to India because he thought the India, he didn't want to go, because he thought the India of his ancient texts, he knew the India of the 19th century would disappoint him bitterly. It would be dirty and dusty and hot. So he decided never to go because he preferred his Sanskrit texts and an India of ancient grandeur. But that's by the by. Um, Muller was himself in a footnote to one of his books. It's a very interesting footnote. It describes how when the first generation of Indians began to go to Oxford and Cambridge. These were usually elite Indians who hoped to sit the Indian civil service exams when they went back. Now, Muller had never been to India, so he'd never had a chance to talk to Indians. Now, a handful of Indians were coming to him, so he was very excited. He could now actually ask contemporary Indians about their religion. He himself, in the footnote, describes how he ran after these young men, they were at that point all male, to ask them questions. 
In my mind, I think these poor young men, first they are subjected to the appalling weather and appalling food of England. They're already in culture shock. And then on top of that, this professor is running down the corridor to ask them questions. He himself describes, though, he would ask them questions, what do you believe? And they would look at him puzzled and say, we don't understand your question. <laughs> because for them, their Hinduism was not a matter of beliefs. In the same way that Japanese people today can go to a Shinto shrine and to a Buddhist temple, even on the same day, and they see no contradiction between how can you believe in Shintoism and believe in Buddhism? Because these are practices which are not just happening in our heads. They're not matters of belief. So the category religion is a prime example of one of those modern categories deeply embedded in our history, so thoroughly naturalised. We all use it, me too. But actually, it won't serve its purpose. It's not a universal category. Um, Sorry, and there was a second part to your question, which I forgot. Yeah, but we can return to the second part, because mm. you, you also mentioned a problem with another category, which is the category of belief mm. in health. I mean, in, in some of your texts, you argue that actually one thing that historical practice, as we are used to do it, mm. um, believes is mm. that there is something that is a subject that produces knowledge and that knows mm. by that production something that is outside an object. Mm. So in the sense that we get to know something or we believe in something and in the sense that we do the history of something. Mm. And this comes, uh, uh, goes in the, uh, uh, along with the, the question I have uh, just uh, made uh, before. In the sense that, for instance, mythological accounts, they do not stress this um, division between mm. uh, what we are speaking about and what is being uh, discussed, represented, in the sense that there is no division between representation and reality. Um, isn't a kind of historiographical myth mm -hmm. believing that there is such a division? And in, in, in that sense, the way you uh, evoke historiographical work by saying that we are never studying something that is outside of our own research agenda, of our laboratory, of our perspectives, uh, but we are always knowing and at the same time developing our ways of knowing, is not that similar to the way myths are developed? I mean, you are quite right that some of the things I'm, I'm working on now, and in fact the paper I'm presenting on Friday, um, is I gave religion as an example of a specific category. Now, history at a level of abstraction is, of course, in a sense much higher. It mobilises all these categories, religion, civil society, state, etc. I think, relig I think history as a category also needs to be interrogated. I think it too has built into it a series of presumptions, one of the most important of which you've just pointed out, which is a presumption of all of our, what I call modern Western knowledge, which is that knowledge is a relation between a knowing subject and an object. Now, again, this is so deeply embedded in us, again, myself included, that these are not just things we believe. These are almost part of our muscle memory. I mean, these have been part of our way of inhabiting the world. So it's very hard to get the critical distance from it to even see that this is a presumption, not a fact about the world. One way we can do that is to know that there are other people in the world before, sometimes even now, for whom this is not a shared presumption. The point is not whether initially whether we are right or whether they are right. It's just to be able to relativise ourselves in the sense of being able to see ourselves as our knowledge as a knowledge and not as knowledge with a capital A. Um, now, in a moment, I'll get to history, which is the big category. But let me give you an illustration of this, and it comes from subject lessons. Um, I think it's the first chapter on cramming. I collected a lot of historical material on how the British and many Indians, educators, public officials, colonial officials, etc., complained all the time that Indian students, having been provided with modern knowledge, schools, universities, chose to pass their exams by cramming, by which they meant rote learning, memorising everything. Um, 
And this is a persistent complaint across 150 years. And educators tear their hair out. You know, we finally provided these people with the way to know the world. And what do they do? They do exactly what they did with their traditional knowledges. They learn it all off. And then they regurgitate it in exams. And to make matters even worse, sometimes they regurgitate it quite well. And they, <laughs> and they get good marks in their exams. But we are failing in what we set out to do, which is to educate them to actually engage the world in a knowing way, not, not, not in their old ways. Now, it took me a very long time. I'm embarrassed now at how long it took me to ask what is the most fundamental question, what presumptions do you have to make to see rote learning as a failure of knowledge rather than a form of knowledge? Right. Now, here, what I'm saying is, uh, by the way, I tell my students do not rote learn. So, so I'm not advocating rote learning, but as a scholar, I'm simply asking, why do we assume rote learning is bad? Rote, le rote learning has a long history, not only in the non-Western world, but in the Western world. You know, Thomas Aquinas was, was greatly admired because he had committed hundreds of texts to his memory. Um, why and when did we start thinking that to memorise something is a failure of knowledge rather than a form of it? And once I asked this question, and it took me an embarrassingly long time to realise this was the real question, then my work was easier, because then I could say, or I could see, that we have built into our conception of knowledge a knowing, almost a romantic subject who must encounter the world and make knowledge of it his or her own. Right? It's only genuinely knowledge if, as it were, it wells up from inside us. If it's simply a repetition of something else, then it's not genuinely acquired. Now, that, it seems to me, is a, a very fine illustration of how the subject-object relation is defining of what we understand to be knowledge. And when we encounter any other form of knowledge, it only seems to us like a failed form of knowledge. But I want to suggest to you that that, again, as a teacher in a, you know, in a modern university, I tell my students, do not rote learn. So the point is not to say, return to rote learning. The point is to recognise the historical and cultural specificities of our forms of knowing. And I think that applies to history writing as well. But in what about the category of history itself? Yeah. The category of history, um, there's a number of ways of doing this. Um, okay, let me be provocative and say we, we, we normally assume that history has a very long genealogy. You know, Herodotus, Thucydides, take your pick. Um, and therefore, our, our story is an incremental one. There were the great Greek historians, some great Roman historians, then a not-so-great period for a very, very long time, the, most of the medieval period, and then we get to the Renaissance and so on. I want to suggest to you that history writing, as we understand it, is actually a quite modern invention, and that the genealogy that we normally give it is largely fictional. Um, it wasn't until many, some years back that I picked up and read some of Herodotus that I realised how much of it is fable. I mean, this is not, it's a wonderful read. We should all read Herodotus. But the idea that this is, you know, the precursor to history just seems to me utterly fanciful. Thucydides makes up the speeches of many of his, of his historical actors. The famous Melian dialogue is Thucydides' words, not anyone else's words. There's no document attesting to this. It seems to me generally that we academics are amongst the greatest folklorists in the world. We construct these elaborate genealogies for ourselves in order to endow our present activities with the, a dignity that goes back you know, thousands of years. So if it's true that history is a modern practice, no more than a few hundred years old, then it seems to me it's also true that history is a practice that has a series of presumptions built into it, which will be the subject matter of my paper on Friday. One of them is that the past is dead. Right? One of the most important presumptions of modern history writing is that the past is dead. You can't resurrect it. You can't um, bring it back to life. It doesn't... You know, you know the famous quote from Ranke that everyone quotes about, um, you know, some people say history is to enlighten and so on. I claim no such thing. I just aim to tell it as it really happened. This is endlessly quoted as the charter of objectivity, and then nowadays people proceed to criticise it because, you know, objectivity is impossible, etc. I think what's often missed is, and what seems to me more important, is that Ranke is saying that 
History is a cognitive enterprise. It has nothing to say morally, ethically, etc. Why is it a cognitive enterprise? It's a cognitive enterprise because the past is dead. We can only know it, nothing else. Now, one of the striking things about other forms of historicity, I don't mean modern history, all peoples have a sense of historicity. I think a sense of historicity is universal. Not all people have a sense of history as we understand it. Now we get to your question, what privileges our sense of history over theirs? I'm asking that question, and increasingly it seems to me I'm not sure there's a good answer to that question. I'm not sure that our sense of historicity is privileged in relation to that of others. That doesn't mean we should stop doing it. We can't stop doing it. It's a feature of our culture, of our history, etc. But I do think it might be useful to start thinking about the limits of our knowledge forms rather than constantly assuming their inevitable superiority and that they lie at the, the telos of a history which has left everyone else behind. Uh, yes, <laughs> OK. Uh, no, I was thinking of about what you were saying. Um, and uh, so all historians, almost all historians nowadays would recognize, as you were saying, that uh, our historical accounts of the past, uh, the books we write, the articles we publish, they are uh, an account of the past from a certain point of view, which is our present point of view. Uh, this is something that almost all historians nowadays, mm -hmm. in a post-ranking moment, yeah. we could call yeah. it, accept. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what they do not accept, mm -hmm. so let me just be sure mm -hmm. that I am understanding mm -hmm. you correctly, what we do not accept as historians is that the idea that there is a past mm. is something objective. That there is actually a past beyond our belief that there is mm -hmm. a past. Mm -hmm. This, if I'm correct, uh, okay. mm. uh, I, I was wondering if, uh, for instance, um, we cannot find within the debates among historians uh, some examples of uh, this notion you are uh, stressing that the idea that there is a past is uh, a presumption, not a fact of the world. For instance, uh, all the critiques that um, mediev medieval or early modern historians do hmm. against uh, late modern contemporary historians, hmm. saying that they actually don't study the past, hmm. but that they study uh, the present, that their objectivity is less accurate because they actually are studying the period they are living within. So this perhaps is an example of where the idea at least of where the past and where the present, uh, where the past ends and where the present mm -hmm. starts is completely subjective. Uh, the other example would come from debates on memory. Mm -hmm. um, which you know much better than I. The, the, for instance, the, the, the concept of trauma, mm -hmm. that we are, as historians, uh, available to accept, uh, but at the same time, it's perhaps a concept that points directly to what you were saying, that is, the trauma is a past that has not, not yet died. Passed. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, in, in this sense, mm. at, at I would say that even prof modern Western history, somehow within itself, has uh, opened the door for the kind of arguments you are making. Oh, absolutely. Look, I, I would be mortified if anyone here thought I was claiming yes. that I have come up with all... You know, I, 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 like all of us, I build, I have learnt so much from others. So. The point is not originality. I'm absorbing like a sponge the way we all do what's going on. And we selectively absorb what interests us more than other things. So very much so. I'm indebted to Hayden White, Ranjit Guha, perhaps above all to my friend Debesh Chakrabarti, to, to many people. And, and it's out of debates in modern Western knowledge that I am. 
And not a word I've said is a word against modern. I'm, I'm not interested in better or worse. As I say at the, the passage you began with, you know, I am, as, as with most Indians and certainly all Indian intellectuals, I am one of Macaulay's bastard children. I mean, I teach in a university. It wouldn't matter whether it was in India or Africa or anywhere else. A university, by definition, is an institution of modern Western knowledge. Um, so I'm not against it. I'm trying to th think through it, its possibilities and also its limitations. Um, and when it comes to its limitations, you asked about history, the first part of your question. I, I think the debates on objectivity and presentism, you're, you're right. I mean, to the degree that anything is ever settled in the human sciences, I think that is settled. Today, very few historians would claim in a Rankian mode or, or like that very old-fashioned historian who was important in England in the 60s, the one who used to write about the Tudors, I've forgotten his name. Hardly Lemian. anyone would claim. Sorry, Lemian? No, a little later. He, w he was the one who got very upset with E.H. Carr when the E.H. Yes. Carr book was written. Um, but hardly anyone today would claim history is objective. Or, so that is sort of largely finished. There is a past, I agree. I'm, I'm not saying pasts are made up. But as I'll be arguing on Friday, there isn't a past that we just stumble upon. There isn't a past in the sense that there are rocks or there are trees. The past is an object that has to be constituted. This is, again, this is not my point. This is Levi Strauss, it's Louis Althusser, it's, you know, the, the, the past is, is not... I give an example in one of my essays that Indian peasant, even today it's a debate in India, people of my class get horrified that ordinary people will, on the wall of a historic monument, pee. They'll relieve themselves. And, you know, middle-class Indians with a historical sensibility are always horrified. What's wrong with these? Don't they realise our glorious national past? And here they are pissing on it, you know. Um, what's wrong with that? It's not that these people are stupid. It's not that they don't have a sense of pastness. Their myths, their epics, their legends, I mean... They very much have a sense of pastness. It's not constituted on similar sorts of grounds as ours. So I think there's a past, but we never encounter the past in the raw. We always construct it in advance. And I think modern history writing is one way of both constructing the past and constructing a relation with it. And I think epic, for instance, is another way of doing that. Pastness, I think, is a human universal. So my argument is not that there are people without a past. I think there are people without a sense of modern history, but they have other relations with their past. Let me just uh, insist on this, but now in a different uh, direction. Uh, one of the problems, I mean, one of the major problems your, you work on is, uh, therefore, how modern Western knowledge, and you make a, 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 a strong argument on the need of defining it both as modern and Western, that is giving you a, 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 a time and a space, how modern Western knowledge therefore uh, encounters or disencounters itself with non-Western pasts. Mm -hmm. um, but at the, same, uh, at the same time, you also mentioned that this kind of disagreement um, between the code of history, the code of modern Western knowledge, and the past it's it it trying, it 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 trying to grasp, that this kind of disagreement also happens when modern Western knowledge faces pre-modern, even if Western pasts. Hmm. There's a text of, uh, uh, you wrote where you underline, for instance, where you quote Michel de Certeau when he refers to how come we modern uh, intellectuals, European intellectuals, engage or try to analyze our pre-modern ancestors uh, in, what come, in what has to do with religion mm -hmm. or, or, other, or other things. Um, so, at, by, by, on the one hand, you, you say that this also happens with pre-modern uh, Western pasts. 
But on the other hand, sometimes you also say that there is a specificity on the disagreement between Western knowledge mm -hmm. uh, and non-Western paths, that there is a kind of a, a more deep disagreement, mm -hmm. I would put it like this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why, why, why the distinction? Yeah. yeah, it's uh, something I'll be returning to on um, Friday as well. Uh, but the, w the the paper you refer to, I, I there's a wonderful quote from Michel de Certeau who addresses this question. He says, "The modern French historian writing about the seventh, say, se I think it's seventeenth century France, yeah. encounters his, his subject, the, the the text he's studying." of someone who attributes agency to the Christian God. Um, so this person or this text is explaining certain historical events as a consequence of God's agency. And Sertot says what history does is, he, it, it, he uses the wonderful metaphor of castling. I don't know if any of you play chess, but in chess there's, there's a moment when you can castle the piece on the end of the board and the king can swap over like that. And he says what we do is we castle. The modern historian, the text explains things as an effect of God. The modern historian explains belief in God as an effect of the world. So we provide, the text says the social is to be explained in terms of God. We say God is to be explained in terms of the social. Now, and that is my example of how the modern historian of Europe confronts the same problem as the modern historian of India or Africa or anywhere else. Um, and I think there is a problem with the code of history the moment it is about pre-modern pasts. I think the difference, that's, which is your question, the difference is that for the historian writing about Europe, and it doesn't matter whether the historian is Europe or not, none of this is about identity. It could be an Indian historian who's a, someone who's ethnically Indian but is a historian of Europe. It's the knowledge form that matters, not, not the person doing it. Um, the historian of Europe can, however, presume that that text of the 17th century assumed has some sort of historical continuity with the now, with our knowledge systems now. In other words, in, in Gardamerian terms, you can sort of say there can be no fusion of horizons between me and this text because we cannot agree on God as an agent. However, in encountering this 17th century text, I encounter an earlier moment in my own tradition, a tradition which I now reappropriate and revivify, I keep alive through changing it. Now, what happened in India and in many colonial countries, what happened is instead of a continuity, there was an absolutely sharp break, a caesura. Sanskrit knowledge forms and vernacular knowledge form, forms of knowledge production were alive and flourishing and then suddenly there's like a cutoff point. And one of the reasons I was interested in education, which otherwise is not a particularly interesting subject, was that in India, you know, it's the introduction of schools, universities, the decision that those old knowledges are not to be taught. Now, for the Indian historian or the historian of India, I think there's, there's, there's a deeper problem. He or she has the same problem as the historian of France, but with the addition that he or she cannot even assume the historical continuity which will redeem the anachronism that the European historian also faces. And that is because of that sharp line dividing us from past traditions of thinking and knowing. An example, sorry, an example is, you know, in Europe, you can read Renaissance texts, medieval texts, and even if they sound strange to you, they're not purely or not necessarily purely of historical interest, right? People read them as if they were in some way alive. The striking thing in India, the one place I know a little bit about is, no one reads earlier texts as if they spoke to the present. They've become the subject of annotated editions of the only approach you can have to them is a historical approach. Here you can sit and read Aristotle or Aquinas and still think, you might have an annotated edition, but you might still be having an engagement with Aquinas. He might still speak to the present. There is nothing in our past which still has that status because the break has been so profound or the sense of a break in that continuity.
Let me make one final question before opening the floor for discussion and now trying to come once again to your uh, own uh, personal trajectory, but mainly not your personal in the sense of your biographical trajectory, but your academic uh, trajectory. Um, the move uh, we were discussing uh, some minutes ago, that is from a critique of um, Eurocentrism, uh, critique of Eurocentrism that is concerned with the possibility of developing better knowledge beyond the Eurocentric perspective, <laughs> and the move from that kind of critique of Eurocentrism that we can, even if schematically associate to historical sociology kind of approaches, to a critique of Eurocentrism that is a critique of knowledge in itself, that kind of move that um, some questions before we were schematizing, you were uh, saying that it corresponds to historical sociology on the one hand and post-colonial theory on the other hand, can also be identified with the trajectory of the group, and not to come to the title of our conversation <coughs> also, to the group uh, in which you participate or in which uh, you, your, I would say, academic tradition, uh, um, uh, in which you in insert yourself in your trajectory, the subaltern studies group in the sense that in the subaltern studies group there was also a first attempt to provide, uh, even if not most scientific accurate explanation of Indian history, this was not the, 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 the language that was mm. being used, that was perhaps the point. And from the mid 80s on, there was a turn from this kind of more Marxist scientific uh, approach uh, to a more post-structuralist, post post-modern, if we can use the mm -hmm. this word, approach. Is is this correct? I mean, and and you actually took part on the second. Uh, you are much more engaged with this second uh, kind of uh, um, subaltern studies approach, close to Deepa Chakrabarti book of uh, professionalizing Europe, perhaps the most relevant of, yeah. of, of all of these books. So one, one question that, uh, the, this final question was um, somehow uh, in order to ask you to talk a little bit of your relation to the subaltern studies group. Mm -hmm. I know Ranajit Guo was your supervisor. Um, and this uh, passage from Marxism and science on the one hand mm -hmm. to a um, much more post-structuralist and critic of science approach on the second half of, of the 80s. Yeah. I, I should say, first of all, that I was never a member of subaltern studies, but it is true that in some ways, intellectually, it was very important for me, Ranjit Guha was... Actually, I had two supervisors. One was a quite well-known Australian philosopher, Eugene Kamenka, um, and Ranjit Guha, and Eugene Kamenka, he, he was a f very fine mind and a nice man, but he was quite right-wing, and Ranjit Guha was, of course, very left-wing. Um, so it was an interesting experience being a PhD student. Um, but, I, yes, I was associated, I was influenced by... your, And I agree with your distinction. I'd introduce one qualification. I don't think subaltern studies ever, even in its beginning, was scientific. There was too much, you know, for Ranajit Hegel was such a decisive influence that I think the early volumes of subaltern studies over which his shadow, his presence looms very large, was certainly Marxist, was influenced by Maoism, but was never aspired to that sort of scientific socialism, say, that came from Eastern Europe or um, um, and so on. Um, but there was... Uh, a change partway through the project. Um, it also split the group to some degree. One of the, its very important members uh, and a friend of mine again, Shumit Sarkar, became a very vocal critic of the group that he had once belonged to on the grounds that it had missed its vocation by becoming a form of culturalism and being hijacked by postmodernism and, and other terrible evils um, when it should have stayed resolutely, you know, good Marxist, intelligent Marxist. Um, 
I think some of the logic of that actually arose out of the project itself. I think it began in the programmatic statement that opens volume one. Ranajit Guha says something about the, the failure of the nation to come into its own. And what was present in that remark was the longing that the nation could come into its own. That, that, that the problem with the Indian nationalist movement was that it was, in some sense, insufficiently radical. I think a few years later, many members of the group are beginning to think, well, that may be true, but there's a problem with the nation form in and of itself, whether in its radical version or in its non-radical version. Similarly, I think the project in its early stages had a sense... You know, someone like Ranajit was much too intellectually sophisticated to ever say this, but I think implicit in some of those formulations was the idea that somehow you could recuperate a subaltern consciousness and agency. And I think partway along the way, again, partly because of external influences, um, post-structuralism, certainly the interventions of Gayatri Spivak and others, um, some people in the group began to think that the problem was not, that the aim should not be to recuperate an insurgent subject, but to problematise the idea of subjectivity itself. So I think there was, without a doubt, a change in the, in, in the group, but I think it was partly driven by its own earlier presumptions coming under critical examination by those who were using them. But that was an unequal process. Some people did that more than others, and you know, one of the striking things about subaltern studies, and I say this as someone who was not a member of it, is that the earlier volumes had a greater thematic unity because there was a shared sense of project um, and later on, there are still many interesting articles, but it's clear that there's no common project there. Um, One really final question, hmm. so, and uh, sorry for those who are waiting uh, for... Uh, you mentioned also the relation between Maoist metapolitical movement ideology and subaltern studies. Hmm. Could you just develop a little bit on that? I've, I've written about it. My, my, you know, it seems to me that subaltern studies could not have been possible without a, a short-lived Maoist uprising in India in the late 60s. It was, as I've written about it, it was short-lived, it was for a moment important and then decisively crushed. Um, and in the big screen of history, it looks like a tiny little blip. But I think for cultural and intellectual politics, it was quite important. Um, and I think it was important, I mean, the reasons I'd have to rehearse a long argument, which I won't do, I've strained your patience already. But I think one of the consequences of that uprising was that a section of the left became increasingly, instead of desiring modernity, the socialist modern, it became more willing to interrogate the promises of modernity. Um, instead of wanting a more a genuinely emancipated Indian nation state that would be free of imperialism and colonialism um, and comprador elements, etc., it started to ask questions about what we could... whether the nation state could ever be an adequate vehicle for expressing the aspirations and desires of a very large place with all sorts of diverse people. In other words, I think Mao is not so much Mao per se, but Maoism as it played out in India as a brief moment, actually somehow unleashed other critical energies and became important. And I think subaltern studies tapped into and was partly shaped by those critical energies. There were, of course, also biographical connections. Ranaji Guha was in India at the, I think it was in the latter part of that insurgency and wrote about it. The Besh Chakrabarti was in a minor way involved in it. Um, so there are certainly also biographical links between some of the members of... But not for me. I was six years old when Nakshabadi happened. So. <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. So thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, conversation. Uh, was, at least for me, it was really, really, really interesting. And, um, well, thank you all for being here.